Hey Sarah. Hey Joe. Today we're going to learn about something called the Electoral College. Good guess, Joe. But it's not an actual college. It's part of our election process that was put in place by the framers of our Constitution at the Constitutional Convention of 1787. See, our forefathers didn't want to let Congress alone decide who should be president. But they were worried that if they left it up to the people to decide, most would vote for their local candidate. Obviously, this gave an unfair advantage to the larger states. They wanted the smaller states to have a more equal voice, which meant they needed to come up with a better system. They found the solution in ancient Rome. Romans didn't want the rich to have too much power, so they divided their male citizens into groups of 100 according to wealth, and each group received only one vote. This system was called the Centurial Assembly. It was this ideal of fair representation that our founding fathers used to create the electoral college system in the United States, which gives each state a number of elected representatives, called electors, who formally select the president and vice president of the United States. The number of electors in each state equals the number of its congressional senators, which is always two, plus the number of its congressional representatives, which is different for each state and depends on its population. Over time, the electoral college has evolved a bit, Though the method for choosing electors has changed several times, it is still basically the same. So here's what a lot of people don't really understand. Maybe not even your parents. When people next vote for President of the United States in what is sure to be an exciting 2008 election, what they're really doing is voting for electors, who have pledged to vote for a particular set of candidates. Ballots in some states make it clear that voters are actually voting for electors, who cast the official votes for President and vice president. Article 2 of the Constitution says that each state shall appoint electors in a manner determined by the state legislature. That means that it's up to each state's legislature to decide how electors are selected. In some states, electors are selected by registered voters in an election that occurs several months before the presidential election. In other states, electors are selected by elected officials in the state's political party, such as the state party's executive committee. Typically, electors are individuals who are loyal to their political party and pledge to vote for their party's nominees for president and vice president. Here's the catch. Sometimes the electoral votes produce a different outcome than the nationwide popular vote. Way. In fact, this has happened a few times in our history, but never was it more dramatic than during the 2000 election, which was the closest presidential election in U.S. history. That's the one. Now we all know who won that election. Almost. It was George W. Bush who ultimately became president. But it was one bumpy roller coaster of a ride. As the vote wound down, both candidates had close to the number of electoral votes needed to win. It was neck and neck. And it all came down to one final state. Florida. Things weren't looking so sunny for one of the candidates as the newscasters in bold fashion claimed a victor. Watch. Although newscasters first named Gore the winner, a few hours later they did a turnaround declaring Bush the winner. Gore even called to congratulate Mr. Bush. An hour later he took it back. This was getting better than any movie you could imagine. Anyway, here's how it all played out. Once Florida's count was complete, each candidate had 49% of the popular vote. Out of more than 6 million Florida votes, Bush was ahead by fewer than 2,000 votes. With the vote that close, according to Florida law, a recount was necessary. The election outcome was delayed for over a month, as the entire country waited anxiously. Finally, after several recounts and lawsuits, the U.S. Supreme Court declared that recounting ballots was unconstitutional and said Florida could certify its vote. They did, and on January 6, 2001, Congress met to certify the electoral vote. And so with 271 electoral votes to Gore's 266, George W. Bush narrowly became the 43rd president of these United States. Gore won the nationwide popular vote by more than 500,000. But Mr. Bush had more electoral votes, and that made the difference. 
You might wonder how it's possible for one candidate to win the nationwide popular vote, but not win enough electoral votes to be elected president. Well, it's possible because all but two states have a winner-take-all system, which means that the candidate who receives the most popular votes in the state receives all of that state's electoral votes, even if the difference in statewide popular votes is very small. That's what happened in 2000. Bush narrowly won the popular vote in Florida, and in so doing, he won all of Florida's 25 electoral votes, which gave him enough electoral votes to win the election. The end. Some story, huh? Man, it was exciting. And it really put a spotlight on the Electoral College. Since the beginning, the Electoral College has had its fans and its detractors. Okay, now you're just messing with me, right? Anyway, during its long history, many have tried to eliminate the Electoral College from our political system, but to no avail. The main reason is because no one has come up with anything better. That said, there are compelling arguments both for and against the Electoral College. One of the arguments for the Electoral College is that by requiring a distribution of popular support, it makes sure that states with large populations don't have an unfair advantage. In other words, no one region of the United States provides enough electoral votes needed to win the presidency, so a candidate has to gather support from a broad range of states. Also, people for the Electoral College argue that it maintains the federal system of representation laid out in our Constitution. The House of Representatives was designed to represent the states according to the size of their population. The Senate was designed to represent each state equally, regardless of its population. And the Electoral College was designed to represent each state's choice for the presidency. In contrast, those against the Electoral College argue that the winner-take-all nature of the system makes it difficult for third-party or independent candidates to win enough electoral votes to become president. Needless to say, this ongoing debate will go on for a long time. But there's no denying that just the mere fact that the Electoral College is still around, more than 200 years after it was established, is a tribute to the genius of our founding fathers. Well, as you've seen, the Electoral College is a complex yet intricate part of our election process. The more you learn about it, and the more you get involved, the better prepared you'll be when it's your turn to vote. Hope you had fun, and remind your parents to vote.